people ask me, are you a, an optimist or a pessimist? My answer is always, I'm a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist. And, and then I, I, you know, I always quote the, the promise of world peace, which was released by the Universal House of Justice, the governing body of the, of the Baha'is in 1985, actually. And there's this one brilliant line that's etched into my brain, which is, you know, world peace is not only possible, it's inevitable. And I just, that's, wow. And then, however, whether we achieve that through an act of consultative will or through unimaginable pain and suffering is the choice we have before us. We ask the question, you know, what does our, what does the current culture think about the future? And actually analyzed all the books and movies about the future that, that we could find, you know, so it's, and, and compiled them. And it was, it was several hundred uh, there were specifically feature-oriented novels, feature-oriented um, uh, movies. And I think, I, as I mentioned, you know, 98% of them are dystopian. They're dark. Um, we're, we're, we're very good at describing the world we don't want. Uh, we're actually, and we spend lots of money and incredible amounts of talent describing that world we don't want. And we spent, we are so bad at actually describing the world, it really being able to visualize it and embody it and feel it in the way that you can with a dystopian future. Like if you ask, you know, what what is the future? What does the dystopian future look like? You know, it's Mad Max. It's Hunger Games. It's you know all the amazing number of movies that show us collapse, civilization collapsing. But what if we make all the right decisions and we actually create peace and and justice and abundance and and everybody what does that kind of world look like and uh we're not very good at it and in fact you know the one movie that does does depict actually a a, a, a future that you would want to live in is is star trek but and that's really really far in the future so um but uh so so I think that there's this, you know, the other thing is when you look, um, you know, there's a, a, a passage in, I think it's Isaiah, but it's it's in the Bible where it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And I think we are in a culture that is at risk of perishing because we don't have a, 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 a really clear vision of, of the future and we get stuck in the past. We, we, are uh, we we think the past is going to be the predictor of, of the future and yet um we all we hopefully that that's rarely the case and obviously you can learn from the past but there's so much more now that can be created if uh we 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 start um you know start vision visioning what what we want so so what i guess uh this is a long-handed version so we st one of the reasons it's outlined in the chapter was um, we started something called the Food System Vision Prize, which was, well, let's let's give a prize for people to envision the future um, that they 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 actually want. And uh, we initially, you know, there was a lot of skepticism that anybody would be interested in doing something like this. It's hard to get a group of people together because it had to be a group of people envisioning the food system of their local community. Um, and, and how do you actually go through that process? So we actually created a food system toolkit, uh, prototyped it, went through a whole set of like, how do you actually get a group to do that? So it's all on our website, which is, it, it can be used actually by anybody who wants to envision the future of their community. Because it turns out a food system actually has all the dimensions of, of a future. What's the economy look like? What's the community? What's the culture look like? What's the natural environment? Uh, how does that all work together? And then how do you actually, how are you all going to run it? And, and so people had to struggle with that. Turns out that thinking, we we said, we said the, the, the year 2050, that was almost impossible for almost everybody. It's so hard to think 30 years out uh, because there's so much rapid change happening. People could probably do about ten years, um, uh, but even then, that's not 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 easy to do, especially when we're in an ex exponential change. Like 
you know, what's happening with AI is, is clearly um, uh, massive, but climate change, all the polarization, where all of that's going to lead, it's hard to, but when you, when you just restrict it to your particular community, you actually start, um, what we found is that there was a lot of commonality. We, we had um, 1,300 submissions from 99 countries. And what you end up seeing is that there's a lot of commonality across um, so many communities and so many cultures. Everybody wants uh, the, the food to be nourishing, uh, to the, the food to, for example, to you know, contribute to community building. There's a lot of it. Every, this desire for a community is everywhere. It's, everybody's clear that we've lost community and we need to rebuild it. Um, uh, that we need a new economy that's not so extractive. That's another common theme. Use food as medicine. Everybody knows food can be used for our health, but we're we have these healthcare systems that are, you know, doing the opposite sometimes. Um, so there are those those themes all through, which just it was another indication of how we have a common humanity. We have uh, we may be so different. Our paths may be so different, but we we have common visions of the future, and uh, no matter where in the world, and if we can, it's, it's I think it becomes a point of unity. What's the future you want? And it's it's surprising you can sit down with people with completely different political points of view, with people you know religious points of view, and we all we have very similar. Uh, goals and desires. And that becomes a point from which you can then start emerging um, and, and uh, creating that future with, with very diverse people. Um, the, there is conflict when it comes sometimes when you start envisioning what to actually do. Uh, there's different priorities. The, in, the other interesting thing we learned is that if groups first identify the key principles that they wanted to be guided by. They were had a much easier way, uh, much easier to resolve their conflicts than groups that just started designing and, and developing. So identifying core principles, and I would say spiritual principles, that if you look at them, you know, they would equality, justice, uh, harmony with nature, there was, there was a set of uh, common principles that almost everybody ended up choosing. Um, when you have those core set of principles, you can go back to them when there's conflict and you can say, how do we apply those principles? When you don't have that, you get into these locked, uh, you get into to, to locked combat sometimes and, and the groups would fall apart. So this having a core set of as principles is critical to creating a future um, vision. So I, I thought that was really, really interesting to see and observe. Uh, is it, uh, have you implemented any specific exercise that you can share about the identification of those key principles? Because I guess it's something that can be applicable to any any sort of uh, project, uh, co corporate or not corporate uh, type of projects, right? And it's such a difficult um, think to, to identify as an individual and then as a community. I don't know if you have- uh, Examples uh, of how, of what people had have done in that. Yeah, um, or yeah, how you have facilitated the process to identify those key principles. Um, uh, uh, yes, let me, let me just actually pull it up. This was one group called the Global Alliance for the Future of Food. And they went through a whole series of conversations around what are the core principles they wanted their, their um, future to be. And so, for example, it included renewable, uh, resilient, equitable, diverse, healthy, inclusive, interconnected. Those were the, those are the principles that they, they had chosen. And you can see that, you know, you know, for example, one of the things that's so critical is that we've created these um, food systems that are not diverse. And as a result, they destroy the environment. They're unhealthy for us. We need to bring back that diversity. And what's interesting is as you bring back diversity, you also recognize, well, and then we need diversity in our human community. It can't all be the same people. 
because it's it just as an ecosystem requires diversity to be healthy, we need diversity in in our community, and it, it led to all kinds of really wonderful um, questions. So, th th so this is an example of of identifying core principles that then helped en en envision uh, envision the future. So you were saying that it is challenging in general for people to to paint uh, vivid and positive pictures of our ideal world, right? There has been a lot of work behind to, to find those uh, this mass that could envision uh, a more optimistic uh, yeah. future. Have you been able to identify why it is so challenging and what can actually inspire people to adopt this more uh, optimistic and positive outlook when, when envisioning this future? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be curious to hear from others in terms of why the, the kind of a negative future is so prevalent. M my theory is that um, um, one is dystopian novels and books are quite entertaining. They really, they are. So that's, there's an entertain entertainment value there. I think doing things I think we are programmed in some way from our history to pay attention to the, to when things go bad and what causes pain. It helps us, you know, survive. Uh, and, and so we are very in tune to the negative because that's what can potentially kill us or hurt us. Um, and we have to, I think as human beings, we have to rise above that sort of animal nature to, uh, to envision you know, be, go beyond that. What, what, what is, what's the potential? What's the possible? And, uh, and that's where the, you know, the, the quality, the, the quality of imagination is, uh, is so powerful. The, and, and, and then giving people time to imagine. I think we are in such a busy, busy world. Actually imagining the future takes a lot of energy and, uh, and I think is best done in a group, you know, at MIT, uh, the system dynamics group has this has this uh, description of when you get a group of people together, um, it creates a fourth person perspective. Um, the first person is your own particular perspective that's relevant to you. Second person is when you're interacting with another, uh, with uh, with one other person, um, the interpersonal. Then there is the third person, which is your objective. You step out of the group and you're looking at the group. But when you're part of a group, uh, they they say some a social field gets created, and in that social field, you can bring the future forward. And I, I actually love love that. You almost become a channel for the the. It, it's another word for spirit, but you know when you're an MIT secular, you can't use the word spirit. So. Uh, you use social field and everybody totally gets it. Like a, a group of people has an energy to it. And, and when the, that group of people is aligned and they're creative, um, it, it, is, um, it, it starts generating something that's, that you can't do just on your own. I, I was just, I was watching a Ted talk where, like hope is something that has to be done in in relation. You you create hope within a group. You can't just create hope inside yourself. It's not. It's very hard. Um, it, it, creating the future is also done. I think most effectively when you have created a social field that's generative, that you're you know that recognizes that we're in a participatory universe and we are we are participating in cre in creation. Um, uh, which I, I love that idea is that you're, you know, and, and then we need others to bring the future into reality. Thank you, Roy. That's really, yeah, it's so helpful. And then this is just so interesting. And Martina and Danielle have already heard this theory because of when I pre presented it at EBBF, but um, subcon like sub subconscious limiting beliefs are, that's my wheelhouse. And so I have my two balls in the back. The giant green ball is your subconscious mind and the little green ball is your conscious mind. <laughs> and the subconscious mind is, as you know, from a psychological perspective has a negative bias. And for exactly the reasons you were saying for an evolutionary perspective and also from the dystopian movies and books and everything, 
it triggers the, that primal fear. And so it's, it's uh, unfortunately, if you're not conscious to it, it automatically draws, draws you in. And um, what I love about, you know, like you say about groups and, you know, and then what I love about my tool as well is, is it soothes that subconscious. And when it's soothed, it actually gives you access to that higher social, spiritual self. Um, but it needs to be regulated in order to do that. And I do have a question in regards to that is to with, cause I, I love the intro on the website um, about the food, you know, about food being really complicated. Cause I thought that was on so many levels. And I wondered if there's, uh, if you, if your area or your um, foundation is addressing that from that mindset perspective, because it, it triggers such a primal part of us that it makes it really difficult to entertain new ways of thinking, new ways of being. It, it, that that the complexity overwhelms us. Yeah, yeah, and if yeah, and if there's anything within your foundation that like that you're addressing that that component of it. Yeah. So that I mean, I think that is a challenge. I mean, to have a functioning e ecosystems by their very nature are co pretty complicated things, right? Like nature has evolved. You think about it, a million different species all interacting and creating and somehow finding balance. And it's just overwhelming, right? You know, there's when you pick up a teaspoon of soil, there are more microbes in that soil than there are human beings on the planet, right? There's this just billions and billions in this little, and then all of them are somehow coexisting and 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 finding. Uh, yeah, so, so the complexity gets... Gets over, complexity gets overwhelming. I, I think one of the ways to to manage that complexity is to a name it, but then go to the to, to the next level is to recognize diversity and complexity is part of, and you get you just get comfortable with diversity and complexity as a as as natural, and and then re, and then you to some extent you have to let go because. You're, you can't control fully the system. You can contribute to it. And uh, and then the system is going to do its things and you're just here in this, as, a, as, as part of a learning process. I, I, that The other other thing is this, you know, you're, Shelley, uh, Sherry, you're, you're probably much more aware and attuned to this, but you now how do you create the growth mindset, which is always learning? And, 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 and instead of getting overwhelmed by complexity to ask, to become curious about it and recognize you'll never get it all, you're never gonna figure it out, but we can be curious and discover a little bit more here and there. And that's enough to, to make progress. You don't need to figure it all out to, to make progress. But I'm, I'm curious, how, do you, how would you answer that, Sherry? <laughs> Well, I'm very biased to my tool, Roy. <laughs> uh -huh. And um, but I feel I love the word curious because you can't you can't be in that um, sympathetic nervous system in the stress response and be curious at the same time. Yeah. And that's and moving into that relaxation response is everything because it's that's where you feel safe and that's where you feel um, that's where possibilities are. And so yeah. I love love that you use the word curious and and it's yeah I just even within our own family because it's like we have a vegetarian we have a vegan we have a meat meat eater and it's like even you know we and we all try really hard to be very open but you can see the complexity just in the in the microcosm let alone going to the macrocosm and <clears throat> anyways it's just it's beautiful what you're doing and and um yeah I don't I don't have all the answers but in my little corner of the world um, yeah. using EFT tapping really uh, opens up possibility for people because of that nervous system regulation and 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 the safety it creates. Yeah, I, I like I like that that idea of in order to really uh, maximize curiosity and being that place of possibility, you actually have to feel safe and and you know to really gener generate generate. Um, uh, the kinds of visions we 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 want. Um, th there is sometimes necessity also require forces you to to move in a particular you know uh, crisis can also be a, a, a 
a form of creating can can also create creativity. So I wonder if there's multiple places where creativity comes from. And and I think my, my guess is that the highest level comes when you're completely safe and 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 super generative and you can really think in the future. When you're in a crisis, you're trying to get out of that crisis, that also creates a whole bunch of creativity. But my guess is that's probably a little bit more shorter term because you just want to get out of the crisis, right? I, I don't have the answer. I have more a question, and, uh, and I'm reading the chat before that somehow Kennedy, he got us all excited about getting this man on the moon. So it was, I think, one of the, from the 60s and 70s or 50s, people were dreaming of this magic world. Everything looks so beautiful and so amazing and so utopistic positive. And I'm not sure where we've got it wrong because it's the same human beings and something has changed since then. So I'm not sure where the trigger was with that. I think one element is narrative. And so I'd be curious to hear about the narratives, the spark, the desire in people to make this future, to dream this future, to make them happen. So the narrative that sparks a desire to go in a certain direction, which at the moment is lost. Uh, and the second question is about circles. We, you're a number of circles that create the future, that create impact. How can we choose our circles so as to be in a better position to be creating uh, futures and to be creating what we want to create because not every circle is equal. What are good circles and what are not so good circles to go forward? That's a great, so this this question of narrative is, yeah, super important, especially because when you, you know, when you, when you look at the reality of the world, there is real good reasons to be pretty pessimistic. <laughs> There is, you know, not only do you have climate change, which is going to fundamentally change reality as we know it, um, you've got this, you know, toxic polarization, which, you know, if history is any guide, and in this case, I think it is, polarization inevitably leads to violence. Um, and And then you throw AI on that, that can exemplify all the worst characteristics of humanity as well as its best, but it's going to be used for its worst. We know that it already has. So you've got this very, very almost challenging mix that is going to threaten so much of it. So there, there's a very good re I think you, you have to acknowledge, yes, there's good reason to be worried and, that, and potentially pessimistic, um, at least in the short run. And this is what, I, when I, people ask me, are you a, an optimist or a pessimist? My answer is always, I'm a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist. And, and then I, I, you know, I always quote um, the, the promise of world peace, which was released by the Universal House of Justice, the governing body of the, of the Baha'is in 1985, actually. And there's this one brilliant line that's etched into my brain, which is, you know, world peace is not only possible, it's inevitable. I just, that's, wow. And then, however, whether we achieve that through an act of consultative will or through unimaginable pain and suffering is the choice we have before us. And I, I say, I quote that and I say, well, if there was a moment in the 90s where it almost felt where we, we were going down the path of collective will to choose peace. I mean, it almost, it, Berlin Wall fell and oh, there's all this possibility. And then we just decided, well, we've got to choose humanity and all its stupidity decided and with a few bad leadership choices decided to go down the path of pain and suffering which historically has been the way humanity has has made some really great advances um so so i'm i'm and then i say and just because i'm pessimistic about the 10 or 20 years doesn't mean i'm not super optimistic about the future because i think what 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 that calls upon us to do is to actually build the future now so that when all the craziness happens, the, 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 the models we've developed uh, can emerge through the ashes. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's another way of creating hope. Like, okay, it's gonna be hard. Buckle up, put on your seatbelts, work harder, build the community, build the organization, build the models that we need 
to be the seeds of the future that that we that we want you 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 cannot do it if you get wrapped up in in um pessimism pessimism kills hope uh, or long-term pessimism in, in, in that, oh humanity is inevitably going to kill itself that is such a terrible and inaccurate way of 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 describing the future i think we're going to go through really tough stuff but that's that's okay as long as we're learning along the way and um uh, and let's let's figure out how we how we can and 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 i think it's going to be distributed i you know i I, I think whatever happens, it's going to happen in different parts of the world to different in different degrees. We can't predict that. So we everywhere in the world, we got to be there's got to be people working and some people will be able to advance the vision of the future much easier than others, depending on the circumstances in which they're in. So that's how I, I that's the narrative I use to kind of keep people hopeful, but not be like, Oh, well, it's such better than no. It's not much better than you think. It's as bad as you think, but that doesn't mean there isn't hope. Can I just interject there yeah. before yeah, we go sure on? To it? It's uh, a lot of the comments you just made very much parallel my own thinking over many, many decades. Uh, kind of super excited. Uh, during what was my my college years and you know into the 80s and then you know as you refer to Berlin Wall coming down and uh, you know you kind of see everything coming together that oh I can see how we're going to get from A to B and B is going to be great and uh, yeah, but it's been a pretty tough period of time over the last 30 years right um, and I must say of the long term vision. Uh, positive vision is like the most compelling thing about what's reflected in, say, Baha'i teachings. I know this is not about Baha'i stuff, but it, it's there are principles there. There's a long-term vision there, uh, which is, is a, an optimistic um, vision that can give people direction through this rough period of time. And uh, so I, I very much liked what you said, and I kind of liked uh, the way you phrased it in terms of, well, what we can do is we can create little game plans within our areas of expertise and influence, which will take steps toward that vision, even if we can't, you know, individually create it, obviously. But that so once we get through, we, we don't know how we're going to get from A to B, but once we finally get toward B, uh, we'll have some specific plans that hopefully can enable uh, things to work well in our areas of expertise. And just to follow up, I, I was before everybody was on, I, I was just sharing that and we've started a series of uh, future sensing salons in, in New York City as part of EBBF. And, and the idea was, you know, let's get a group of people together and you know, let's pick a spiritual principle and then imagine what the world or what the community would be like if you could fully implement that. So our first, the first principle that was chosen was the elimination of all forms of prejudice. And then you're just like, okay, what would be the impact of that? And I, I have to say, you know, it was just, uh, I think David was on this, uh, 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 was, was with us, but I, I love that, that the potentiality, you know, you get the sense of like, oh, wow, what, what if we could eliminate all forms of prejudice? The implications of that would be, you know, what would it feel like on safety? What would it feel like when, when the, the root cause of most war would, would be eliminated? And then that, how much, you know, the $3 trillion of defense budget spending that uh, could be now leveraged for all kinds, and then actually trying to create physical models of what the space looked like. And then I was saying, the other thing I've been doing with some folks is, you know, ChatGPT has this image uh, engine and you can just write in it and say, you know, what does the future uh, uh, that has eliminated all forms of prejudice look like? And so I just did that. And um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is what ChatGPT comes up with, uh, which I, I think is fascinating from a, like, this is what it picks up from the internet. This is what the future looks like. 
right? And uh, and you and you see just you know anyway, the, and then you can start adjusting this future. So I'm like, hmm, I don't really want to live um, in 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 a city. I make this I make this a rural area. And then it it creates what what is a rural area with the, the elimination of all forms of prejudice. And, and when when you, when you're sitting in a group and you're just like, okay, change that, change this. Oh, well, let's move this around. There's a really kind of a fun um, uh, fun dimension to to to, to that. Um, and I think we should we need to be using those kinds of tools to start imagining uh, what we can do. Let's see, <laughs> it's really quite quite fun. And and then you realize. You know what are the cultural memes that are coming through, and what are the things that are missing uh, in that image of the future that that the that the AI is is not picking up because it's missing some things in there, and, and clearly that oh okay we've got to start working on on uh, because generative AI only works on the data it has, and it cl it clearly doesn't have all the data of what the future should look like or could look like. I had, um, so last year being at EBBF, one of the things that really stood out to me was this, the concept of nobility. And so, Daniel, when you asked the question about creating a narrative and what I'm always working on is actually changing, helping people change their fundamental identity. And I really loved the word nobility because it created this whole image of a completely different identity of humanity. And one of the things that, you know, on a uh, addiction level that it's like when people want to quit smoking, one of the things they found is, is that the easiest thing to do is to say, I'm a non-smoker. And so I wondered what it would be like if we all walked around saying, you know, I'm a noble person yeah. <laughs> and the impact that that would have. It was, it was really meaningful for me. And I just really wanted to share it because I really, the word nobility really just really landed. I love that. Um, so I, I, I just, uh, Put that into ChatGPT and said, you know, make the uh, make it a place where people know their inherent nobility, and this is what it came up with. Isn't that kind of cool? <laughs> and I like why why did it why did it choose these things? But I like this vision of of the future. There there is something no people feel noble, and there's diversity, and there's there's connectedness, and Beautiful architecture and all that. Anyway, for some reason, <laughs> that 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 came up. Uh, yeah. So so just on nobility, it's interesting. Um, at a previous organization, I was I was writing um, kind of mission statement, and um, uh, for for the work we we're doing, and I had put in, um, you know, we would work on food systems that that. Uh, that supported the nobility of farmers. And, and I, I kept, someone kept taking out the word nobility, just, uh, and, and they're like, they didn't want that sentence in there. And part of it is we, there is such a mindset that the, you know, you design a future, it, it really in very materialistic, we're so stuck in, the future is about everybody having it. We have enough food and we're just going to produce enough food and talking about this nobility stuff is detracting. You know, you can't measure it. <laughs> and such a unbelievably, um, you know, limited uh, a view of, of what development is about, for example. Um, but that is unfortunately a very prevalent one. But thanks for bringing it up. I, yeah, nobility is such a powerful principle. Indeed, it is. Uh, I, I just would like to turn on what you were uh, commenting before about uh, long-term pessimism. Uh, and you have also mentioned uh, skepticism, right, when you were uh, launching the, the prize. Is there a way you think to, to leverage those two concepts, right? And... Uh, and make them like a, a fuel for innovative solution. Can, can we turn skepticism and lock their uh, pessimism into something useful and positive in order to drive this sustainable progress? Well, I, I, I said short-term pessimism. 
I, sure. I think long-term pessimism is very dangerous because it eliminates the potential for change. Right? You just inherently believe human beings are evil and therefore we're going to destroy ourselves. Yeah. So and how do you combine short-term pessimism with and skepticism to kind of generate more energy? I mean, I, I appreciate skepticism because you're, if you ask the, but you also have to ask, get them to ask the other side of the skepticism. Well, you know, yeah, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. Well, what, how could you, how could it happen another way? Uh, we have to just skeptics sometimes have a, a narrow set of assumptions and you're just like, okay, it's the, your assumptions are based on these things, right? Well, what if your assumptions were wrong or what if we could shift those assumptions? What would that look like? Um, so that's, uh, that's another, another point. I don't, how, how, how do people work with the skeptics in your lives uh, out there? I'm sure you're all dealing right. with them. Right now it's hard to I was the question to everybody about this because I think I've got the wrong approach. Uh, so the approach that I think universal participation is the answer. But I, I, I struggle with universal participation. So in an organization, you usually have 20% who are amazing innovators, positive optimists, 70% in, in the middle, and another 15% or so that are just always pessimist, always negative. And what I see that works is if you focus on the 20% who are optimists and they drug everybody else, except for the 15% that never get drugged. But it feels wrong. It works, but it feels wrong in a sense that universal participation is what we're aiming for. So I'm in, in a bit of a catch-22 there about how do we make universal participation happen when actually the when I work on the 20%, things really work. And they drag people around and they drag people around and they, and they encourage others and they create the right spirit and then magic happens. So I'm struggling with universal participation. If somebody can give me some hints on that, I would love that. I can see that uh, Rafa has the answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't have the answer. I just wanted to share an experience. Don't look to me for answers. <laughs> um, but something, you know, it was really interesting what, uh, you guys were talking about, and Roy, particularly this notion of the experience you had with the word dignity. And I I wanted to share an experience that I I think is working in our organization. So one of the things that we I was trying to solve is how how do you um you know, how do you change the mindset and the belief system? And how how do you like, how do you actually operationalize the elevation of the organization's culture? And so one of the things that we did was we we one of our core five value five core values is from best practice to next practice. Mm -hmm. And and so whenever a question comes up, we're all okay. Is this best practice or is this next practice? So it it, it was a way that you know we figured okay maybe this is the way to get people to challenge their old assumptions. Mm -hmm. And what they believe is right and the right approach and, and think differently and have, have license to think differently and challenge those assumptions and come up with new ways. Um, and so far, we've actually, um, you know, we've had some success with that in that, you know, we're seeing the early stages of the old assumptions and, you know, words like elevating the human condition have entered into our discussions and discourse. Uh, the, the words meaningful conversations and meaningful consultation has begun to germinate within the vocabulary of the organization. And it really, a lot of it can be pointed back to that. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious, that's, I, I love that as a principle from best practice to next practice. What are the other four of your five? Do you mind sharing? Why would you put me on the spot? <laughs> Go to our website, <laughs> worldpediatrics.org. Uh, no, 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 I, it, it's, uh, it really is interesting. The, um, you know, the centerpiece is, centerpiece is kids first mm -hmm. because we are about children. So everything has to be focused around uh, children. The other, the other is uh, community driven. So we, we don't actually... Um, one of the things that we did early was kind of decentralize the organization. So we we eliminated, unlike many other 
nonprofits, we eliminated the chief program officer position, which is based in the US. And we pushed program into the local community. So it was this notion of community first. Um, equitable access, right, is because, because we work in pediatric surgery, you know, we wanted to make sure that all children, irrespective of, uh, have access to pediatric surgery. So those were some of the other ones. Some of them are, you know, I think that the one around uh, from best practice to next practice was, was much more strategic than anything else because it can really influence the transformation of the language, the thinking, and therefore the culture of the organization. Daniel, I know you had a few more questions. <laughs> you can go with the last I still, one. I still have the pending one in the circles. Which, how do you choose the right circle in which to envision the future, make the future happen? Because there's two elements now. One is dreaming the future, which in itself is a great experience because it prepares you for the future. Because if you start to think, in the future, that might happen, that might happen. Maybe nothing happens, but you're future ready, which is ready in itself. And then the other part is you dream it and then you make it happen, which is the most beautiful one. What's, so I think networking is overrated. That's totally useless right now. Uh, big groups, nah. Circle, for me, right now is the answer to really make powerful first change happen. And the, the shape of the circles, the kind of people in that circle, how would you choose good circles? Let's say, actually say a little bit more about when you when you say circles, what do you mean? And what are the circles you're part of that kind of fit that definition of, of it's, being? Well, we were at the, you know, at COP, we the circle, the food circle. So the all the organizations that go there and specifically there's human beings, like 10, 15, 20, not more than 30 human beings that come together. Circle is obviously a metaphoric concept as a group of people that can make decisions into the future, make things happen. We were at a dinner with lots of CEOs and there was a circle of CEOs or a dinner with community workers. It is circle, a group of people that work together that encourage each other or make things happen. So circles of human beings of different kinds and shapes, 20, 30, 50 max that work together or dream together and so forth. I don't have a good answer to that. <laughs> I think you you have to go with your intuition and observe what they're what they're doing. And yeah, for me, I often like if I don't see it, I create it, right? I think, you know, Daniel, your your comment about the circles makes total sense to me. Uh, was absolutely. Uh, reflected something that we did in my, I was a partner in a very, very large uh, global law firm for many years. And uh, people tend to deal with a certain set of people on a day-to-day -day basis all the time. And what we tried to do was uh, connect them with people they would not ordinarily be associated with from all over the different parts of the world, different, you know, diverse in every way and then bring them together and have them brainstorm about things, about you know, what they would like to do in the future, what, what, would, what would improve the organization in one way or another, et cetera. That idea of circles, especially when kind of people are fresh, new, you're not dealing with them on a day-to-day -day basis, so you don't have established ways, expectations, uh, et cetera. And I, that was very effective. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, the power of the right community, right? Surrounding ourselves by the right people. Thank you so much, Roy. Uh, and thank you everyone for, for joining today.